Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. We are recording this show on a historic day for English cricket. We're at the Oval, where the first ever game of the 100 will be taking place this evening, a women's game between the Oval Invincibles and the Manchester Originals. Um, you might hear some background noise. They're testing out the PA system behind us as we speak. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me today is the magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, the features editor of Wisdom.com, Tara Hashim, and former England cricketer, Mark Butcher. Um... Before we get into the 100, uh, before we get into the Pakistan T20Is as well, um, England dropped a test squad early today, a 17-man group for the first two tests. Headline news, Bairstow's back, Bess is in, Oi Robinson is back, and Hamid, he is in again. There's no James Bracey, Chris Wokes is injured, Joffre Archer is injured. Gary Kirsten, the Welsh fire coach, he leaked the news quite frustratingly last night in an interview with Talk Sport. Uh, Joe, Rob McGregor asks, given there's a T20 World Cup on the horizon and the 100 is starting and would benefit from Bairstow's continued presence, one might argue, is being a squad player for the test team the best use of Johnny Bairstow's time this summer? Uh, It's a very good question for Rob. When we were discussing this on the WhatsApp group earlier, I said, does he want to be picked? Maybe that's a sacrilegious thing to say. Um, Does an England cricketer want to be picked in a test side? But let's be honest, he's been picked essentially as a backup wicketkeeper. Uh, Brace is not there. Folks is obviously still injured. And he's probably two spots away from getting in as a specialist batsman. So things have to kind of fall his way or, or against other people for him to get a chance. I think his time would be better served playing in the hundreds, um, whacking it around for Welsh fire. I know that will upset a lot of people, but there is that sense that Besto does either get messed around or just gets a bit unlucky. And this does feel like another time where he's going to be la- very likely... Um, sitting on the bench whilst the, this new show in town has arrived and he's not not part of it. I wanted to ask Butch as I, I was as I sent that message on WhatsApp did, as a former England Test cricketer is that an awful thing to even think that you might well, not want to be in the an, squad? It's an awful thing to think but only only because I, I presume you're only thinking it because you don't know Johnny um, Johnny would be, he'd be absolutely bouncing off the walls to try and play a Test match now, I know that is, that's not your point. Your point is that he could get picked and not, not play at all. But I think if he feels that he's, that he's in the squad and has a chance, then he'll be desperate to be giving himself a chance of playing. So I, I, don't think, I don't think that would be crossing his mind at all. I think he, what he's thinking is, if I'm not in the first choice, one of those blokes gets injured, doesn't score any runs, I'm there, I'm snapping at the hills, I'm going to play and I'm going to score runs and I'm going to get my test place back. He's, burned, he's been burning to get it back ever since he had it. He got it back briefly in Sri Lanka and then bizarrely was sent home for a rest before being brought back with no chance of being able to acclimatise the conditions, you know, those, those spinning pitches in India, having been in Yorkshire walking the dogs in the, in the snow for the, for the previous three weeks. Um, so, no, I mean, I, and that's, again, you're speculating, I'm speculating slightly, but I know, I know the kid and I think he's, he's, he'd be absolutely busting a gut to be part of it. The 100 will be here again next year I don't, and, and, and the World T20... <sighs> He's a, he's a shoe in, isn't he? He's he's shoe in. He will play. He'll be brilliant, um, but he wants to play Test cricket. Yeah, just to clarify, I'm not thinking Bairstow wishes this didn't happen. I'm thinking if I was Johnny Bairstow and Johnny Bairstow and I, to be fair, are very very different people. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, but, um, I, I I completely get what you're saying. I, I think it is quite different to a normal squad because normally for a home Test squad you have 12, 13, and you know you're very very close. Whereas this. If in a 17-man squad, you know it's because of COVID and you know the specific people are there just for a COVID-related thing, basically. Normally. Normally. Well, do Normally. You, do, you, do you think... Well, do you no, no. I know, have listen, I know... Listen, I know... I know that... I know that the, the, the reason the squad is 17 and not 15 or whatever it might be um, before the test match is because of COVID. But I also think that they are absolutely pooing themselves about the top three at the moment. And are giving themselves as many options as they possibly can to try and cover that off, and and, and even if it's not pooing themselves, it's 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 saying to the guys who are incumbents at the moment, hey, lads, seriously, you you might want to think about scoring a few runs because there's a couple of blokes here we can ship in for you um, straight away. Well, so I, I think there's an element of all of those things. To our one bloke uh, who, who could be one of those players is batting right now. Hasib Hamid is 64 not out as we speak for a county championship 11 against India. An attack featuring Bumrah, Umesh, Siraj, Jadeja, Takur, Callum Dutier asked, could Hamid bat himself into the 11 in this innings? I mean, he's been batting beautifully. We've been watching it today. Um, that pitch doesn't look particularly easy to score on. And then, like you said, Bumrah, Umesh, that's, you know, 
that's, that's to get a score against them is is you know it's perfect preparation for that series um whether he gets into that first test i mean judging by how england have kept faith in that top three for quite a while now i feel like they'll at least give it you know one or this this is a squad for the first two tests i feel like they'll give it at least one or two tests i mean they they've backed burns sibley crawley for you know the majority of the last two years i mean i i I'd be surprised if they kind of just, you know, unless Hamid does something spectacular. I mean, he's still batting. <laughs> you know, he could, he could really force their hand, and that'd be quite interesting to see. But um, right now, I still feel like, well, I personally feel like Zach Crawley is, is worth one more shot in that first test. And you know, Burns has done little wrong. Uh, I mean, I mean, he's done he's done pretty well this summer. Obviously, in against New Zealand and in the championship, um, Sibley got that fifty in that first test. So. It's still hard to kind of see if he, you know, gets in for that first test. Um, but you know, he's still batting right now, so mm. you never know. Joe, Joe, what do you think? You know, uh, when Butch first came on the show, we kind of tentatively talked about the possibility of me playing Test cricket with the next year, and we've kind of been quite cautious the way we talked about it through this summer. But um, you know, he is—he is actually banging down on the door now. Yeah, I was certainly very tentative in the, at the start of the summer. I was like, however many runs he gets, leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. But that's easy to say. And then when he starts doing it, then you're like, oh, maybe. Maybe we should just get him in. Uh, obviously, if, if England's top three were firing, it wouldn't really be a, a question at this stage. But the fact the fact is they're not. Uh, the fact is when not only are they not scoring runs, when you look at the way Sibley bats and he's not successful, then there is that temptation to, to shift things around. Uh, I I think I agree with Saha. I think it will take a, a big score here to change England's mind. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that's the right thing to do, though. I think if England go one nil down this series, it's going to be it's going to be hard to fight back. Like, there are five tests, but it, it's it, when momentum goes against them, uh, particularly given what's already happened this summer, that will be a hard thing to turn. I think England need to pick their best side for that first test, and if that means Hamid comes in and and, and Sibley steps aside, then then so be it. But I I do tend to agree with Taha. I, I don't think they'll go that way. The fact that they've the fact that they have so much cover in the bat in the top order batting department tells you they don't know what their best side is right now, and they're just covering covering the bases. Um, and I, I don't have an issue with that. You know, no nobody, none of the guys have have, ha- have shown the sort of form um, or or sort of technique to say, okay, it was a, what's been going on has been a, a minor blip for them this season. I mean, they've scored literally zero runs. Burns aside, zero runs all summer in Red Bull cricket. Ten Red Bull matches, nothing at all. Plus failing, you know, the failures in the, um, in the two New Zealand test matches. So I, 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 I'm not calling for the heads of these people. What I'm saying is that there are two blokes there who could bat at one and three and, and swap out two, guy, uh, two guys who are not, not batting particularly well, and I, and I think that England's position is such that at the moment they're not one. They they might want to back those guys, but they're not one hundred percent sure that that's the right call, and that's why that's why they've got so much backup in that area. I think. I mean, he's definitely got a strong chance of featuring in the series. I think. I think they, those, they all have. Not those first I mean, that's tests. the point. Yeah. Is that John, Johnny could, if if they don't play in the first one or the first two, they could certainly play in the, in the last three. You know, it's a five it's a five test match series. Bizarrely, I was talking to Ath about. <laughs> I'm going to ask about the Headingley. I've got the, you know, the, the miracle of Headingley poster up on the wall in here. Um, and England used 20 players in that series, albeit it was a, it was a six test match series. They used three wicket keepers. Do you remember, do you remember who they were? Downton. Yeah, it started before my time. Right, okay. So but what I'm saying is this is a series that people yeah. think is etched into folklore. They used three keepers in that. Paul Downton played in one. Bob Taylor, Alan Knott played in those. Um, you had. Oh God, now I can't even bloody remember myself. <laughs> the, the conversation was two weeks ago now. But all I'm saying is over the course of a series which is longer than three, the chances of there being uh, you know, an influx and an outflux of, of players is, is much higher than it would be mm. um, in, a, in a two-match series at, at New Zealand and the, and, this, uh, and the usual threes that we've been getting from people. So, I mean, look, they're in there and they stand a bloody good chance of playing. On me, just play devil's advocate a little bit i understand why everyone's very excited this the story itself of him making a possible return is amazing but at the end of the day he has only scored first class hundreds in two matches in the last five years um he's only a year younger than sibley averages a lot less than sibley um in first class cricket. His, his scoring rate is slower than sibley's in first class cricket as well 
and test cricket for what it's worth. So what is it about Hamid that gets people so excited that th- anyone? I think it's just the way he looks when he bats. It's, you know, we've been accustomed to watching. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a d- disrespectful thing to, to Sibley or Burns, but, you know, there's so many No, no, different... it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's so... You're going to say it isn't, <laughs> but then you're going to do it anyway. But there, there are so many moving parts to it. Um, and, you know, there's so, mm. debate's been ranging, you know, raging around about different techniques in, in English cricket against the red ball. And when, when you look at Hamid, it is, you know, the forward defence. I mean, just watching today, getting right forward to someone like Boomerah. I mean, that's, it's, you know, it's really straightforward when you look at it and so impressive. And I think part of it is just that sort of allure to it. But then also part of it when we talk about Hamid is, like you said, the story. Um, and Let's so be we, honest, that's a big part of it, right? This yeah. is this is a bizarre, incomplete story. Hmm. And we're all anxious to see where it goes next. And and we all, we get impatient as, as journalists, <laughs> as, as hmm. fans, as perhaps sex players as well like you want the, the Sibley story is not an exciting story <laughs> to be honest it, it, it isn't and that's not to say it shouldn't be in the England team but it, but there is we've eked out everything we can from the Sibley story the Hamid story still has so much to offer whichever way it goes uh and we want to see what the next chapter has to bring mm, definitely um you can say something well as Joe said that He's right. The story is the main thing. No, it's not really just just how, how he bats. It's the story. Yeah. No, yeah. I, think, I think he's interesting. Um, just quickly, Joe, on, on, on James Bracey, he's not in the squad. I know he didn't get many runs at all in his two tests against New Zealand, but do you think three innings is enough for England to decide that he's gone from next man in as a number three option or top three option to, okay, you're actually below four or five hmm. other guys? I mean, it shouldn't be enough, but the nature of it is going to stick in the mind for a for a while hmm. um, I mean he wasn't next man in though was he uh, I think he was wasn't well, he no he wasn't because he, he Butler, was the... no because Butler wasn't available no so for a top three option so for a top, oh, three, for a top option. three option so, yeah. so going into that series he was the person okay, who well, was but, uh, he was the next person in Bairstow India wasn't an option there were lots of players who, were, who, who wouldn't have been involved in that in that test match squad who would have been under normal circumstances bat in the top three well where do you think he's going to bat if he plays in, if he plays now well, he 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 was in the squad for the India tour as as a number as a next man in for a top three spot as well. That's where he bats for Gloucestershire. Yeah, but but but, but Johnny Bairstow actually batted three. He wasn't sort of next man in. He was he batted three in in Sri Lanka and he batted three in India in the Test matches he played. Well, you could oh, argue Bairstow's in this squad as a backup keeper to bat at six or seven. Yeah, you could you could argue that. But you know, and when Bracey actually got into the side, it was as a backup keeper batting at six or seven, wasn't it? That's that's how he got that's how he got his spot. That's how he got his spot, but I think they saw him as, as an option for the top three as well. Well, well I'm, but all I'm saying is, is that had all of the other people been available to be selected as backup for the top three, then he might not have got it. That he might not have been the next man in. Is what all I'm saying to you. Yeah, but I don't think they were missing anyone for the New Zealand series. Who, who'd likely bat in the top three in a home series? I mean, we were talking like, on the pod at the start of the year. We were talking about England's top order options, and, and Bracey was was right up there among them and and his county season has absolutely shown that he is that he is in that echelon of mm-hmm. county cricketers unfortunately it all went so horribly wrong in in test cricket that as i say it's going to take a little while to wipe mm. those memories away that doesn't mean he should never play for england again but i'm not surprised he's he's slipped down a couple yeah. of pegs over the last month or so yeah but whether or not he he, he was next man in or not in top three do you do you think that kind of seeing someone play just three innings is enough sometimes no no kind of- no but but again, I will reiterate the fact that had had people who were not batting in the top three, i.e. Stokes, Butler, everybody else, been around, then he wouldn't have been anywhere near the squad in the first place. That's all I'm saying. Mm. That's that's it. It's not not a reflection on whether he's whether his career is over through for three ducks or whatever it might be, or that he'll never play again. All I'm saying is that in normal circumstances, he would never have got selected in the first place, mm-hmm. and I think that's fair. Um, every time there's an England squad, we always get questions about why certain players who've been turning up in the county championship haven't been selected. But I think we've actually got more than those, more of those in the normal this week. Um, so uh, the the run out blog asks, what what does what more does a player have to do? Someone like a Chris Dent, who's been churning out runs for a while and still can't get picked. Alex Lees and Jake Libby have both had outstanding seasons but still can't be selected. Is this just a kick in the teeth to the county championship? Um, I'd argue that. The, the biggest run scores in county cricket do get selected for England. That's how Burns, Sibley, Pope are all there. Is that... They, have, they, have, they absolutely do. And, I mean, really, are we doubting Jake Libby for a test call-up? 
I just think that it's so easy to look at the run scoring charts and say those guys should be picked. You've got to look beyond the last two months. I mean, Jake Libby has shown nothing in his career. He's not a, a young man to suggest that he's going to be a test opener of any permanence. Uh, Chris Dent, I think, is a different example. I think he can consider himself unfortunate over the past few years. I don't have his stats available, but I don't think he's having a stunning season this year at all. Uh, I think and, he, and he's injured. He's injured as well. <laughs> all right, well, that's a definitely a good reason not to pick him. Um, no, I think, actually, especially when these squads are so big, you look at them and you think, well, yeah, I mean... You could argue where, where's Craig Overton. Perhaps he's got a, he's probably got a bigger reason to to feel disappointed than some of those names that are mentioned. Mm. Um, no, I think I think this is part of the problem we have with England batsmen. I think most of us think that they're getting the right players. They're just not scoring the runs that they should. And there's not a wealth of players in county cricket who are going to come in and or are knocking the door down. Um, so no, I, I don't think England selectors <laughs> have got this got this wrong. I mean, it's an interest, interesting question. Is if uh, say the entirety of the of the test team got wiped out and pinged, would England be able to replace the test team as successfully as they did the one day international? No, team? no, yeah. <laughs> there, you go. there you have it. But Next I suppose, question. but I suppose you, uh, but I suppose you would never know until it happened, yeah. would you? But I, but my suspicion is absolutely <laughs> not. Um, you know, there is there appears to be everywhere you go. You know, following the blast round. Um, the last couple of months or so, everywhere you go, there are there are white ball players just coming out of the coming out of, with the goods everywhere you look, um, and yet every time there's a county championship game, you just go, oh my god, why, why is Taryn Stevens top scorer and top wicket taker again? <laughs> you know, and that's just the facts of it. Oh yeah, I was going to talk about this later in the show, but we're kind of talking about it anyway now, so we might as well. Liam Livingston was obviously the, the star of the the white. Are ball you not going to mention Ollie Robinson not being cancelled? <laughs> No one, no one really said he was going to be. No, no, but I just like, I like, I like rubbing it in because you know, having received my calls from people like Hartley Burr and stuff, I just like he wasn't cancelled. See, he came back and played the again. Problem, the problem like is we all said he would. The problem is they're Idiots. not really interested anymore, are yeah. they? So that's, that's they weren't. Funny. They were never I, interested at the time. I don't think Julie Hartley Brewer listens to the show. No, well, she should. <laughs> she should. Um, but yeah, honestly, he's obviously the star of the White Ball series, which we'll get onto in a bit. But in the new Wisden Cricket Monthly that we talked about on last week's show, there's a section addressing the question of basically why aren't English batsmen scoring more first-class runs? I think Livingston is a really interesting case study. In 2018, he very nearly played a Test match. He's a spare batsman on the tour of New Zealand. At that point, he's 24. His first class average at that point was 48.75. He now averages 38. He's gone to completely another level in white ball cricket, and he's not the only example. Joe Clark, 17 first class hundreds before turning 25. Again, he nearly played test cricket in 2018. He was, a spe- he was uh, I guess, picked to a place by, by Ollie Pope that summer. Um, he's not that close at the moment in test cricket, but he's banging down the door in white ball cricket. Is this a, a cyclical thing? Or do you think that our best young batsmen, if they don't play test cricket early, um, just progress quicker in white ball cricket because there's so much more of it. Anyone? I think there are interesting examples. I think Livingston uh, just hasn't been able to play much red ball cricket because other opportunities have arisen, which he would be mad to turn down. And he has also turned down some white ball opportunities in order to play more first class cricket as, as he did at the start of last summer, which COVID didn't allow in the end. So he, he is someone who is he's not like he's nailed his flags to the mast for white ball cricket and white ball cricket only. He's desperate to play test cricket. But he's just, where do you, there's so much cricket. Where do you fit it all in? And and his first class average, I think, is now down at kind of what, 38 or 39, yeah. which, you know, is, is, is fine. It's not screaming, pick me. And he hasn't played enough championship cricket to, it's not door down. Joe Clark is more worrying because he's played a lot of red ball cricket and there has been a kind of, if not a decline, I mean, there has been a bit of a decline and, and there's the odd standout innings but not much more than that and he he is a he's quite we've talked about him before but he's quite a good example of why those players aren't progressing in county cricket Livingston I think is a slightly different one it's not just the batting batting thing as well it's bowling thing as well I mean look at someone like Tom Curran I mean you could say he's sort of the bowling equivalent in terms of a path that Liam Livingston's gone on so you know Tom Curran plays test cricket 27 uh early 2018 um, and yet he's barely played first class cricket since. I mean, his last county championship game, probably 2019, April 2019, something like that. And it's it's that thing where you have players who will maybe get like a white ball looking with England and then they're just constantly part of the squads there and they just don't get that opportunity to, to progress against a red ball. And, you know, I'd be interested to see what Tom Curran's like now with a red ball. You know, he was... He was building his name with the Red Bull initially, and now he's he's only played white ball in the last few years. And you kind of see that with Livingston as well, that same sort of progression where they're in and around that test setup 
and then suddenly out of nowhere they're just almost exclusively playing white ball cricket. Mm. So Akeem Mahmood is, is potentially, this is going to be an issue for him because he is good at the lot. He's great. He's potentially an international player in all formats, but he is naturally going to be led down that white ball path because England want him in those sides. Uh, he's going to have franchise opportunities. Then it's how do you come back and, and take enough red ball wickets to get a, a test call up? And it'd be a real shame if... I think they'll do everything they can to create that path for him, but it's it's a it's a busy busy motorway out there. I tell you what, what it's proven is that once you open the door to prioritising one type of cricket over another, particularly if that prioritisation turns out to be very successful, it's incredibly hard to row back and go the other way, or at least to level things back up to where they were before. And, you know, you have a hundred and however many years of, of first-class cricket being the optimum thing as an example of that. You know, it took forever for England to come round to the idea that more resources and more and more effort and more, um, you know, frankly, exposure needed to be given or more importance needs to be given to the white ball game. When the penny dropped, it dropped and it dropped so hard that, <laughs> that we haven't had a, we haven't had a proper... Can't get it back up. No, exactly. <laughs> we haven't had a, a, a proper... You know, and this is no fault of, of anybody's. We've not had a proper... Um, County Championship season now for two years. The hundreds now come along, which means that it's unlikely that next year we're going to see you know much in the way of cricket, Red Bull cricket through the middle of the summer. And you know it becomes it becomes self fulfilling. The more the more success you have as a white ball nation, and the more glamorous and the more exciting it is to play in England's white ball teams, and we're winning and very very successful. The more the poor relation the Test side comes, and the more the county game gets pushed to the side. And let's face it, playing county cricket is hard work. You know, long old games, one after the other, long season, and you know there's not a great deal of reward for it. There are no big crowds in singing your name, no no Jess Hills singing singing tunes at the halfway break at tea time, um, and so you're starting to go down a, down a route where you think. Christ, are we ever going to be able to row this back? Well, I was, I was going to ask you, when before you played for England and before you went on any tours, A tours, whatever, mm. what did you do in your winter? Because I kind of wonder now that if you're Livingston, mm. if you're not on an England squad, you're, you're doing two or three franchise tournaments. Yeah. Because why not? And then, but then you don't think about playing Red Bull cricket from uh, September one year to March the next. Yeah, I, had, I suppose in the early days I had two, two years of grade cricket. Um, I got within a, a within a whisker of, a, of 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 being talked about to play for Victoria when I was playing in, in for South Melbourne, but they you know they were very much against having um, overseas players in in state cricket, which is absolutely fine. You know that was the, that was their thing, and very few English players ever did it. And you know it was it was an it was idle chat from the from the people in my club, one of whom happened to be on the on the selectors for for Victoria at the time, as opposed to anything that was. Definitely going to happen, um, and then after that, I, you know, a tour in a tour in '96 to Australia, and then England tours pretty much up until, apart from one winter, the winter I got left out, um, the the Pakistan Sri Lanka tours that England won, um, where I was in the I was in the, in the dungeon with Charles Colville for for the whole winter doing doing overnight shifts, which is incentive enough to get yourself back in the England team <laughs> um, but no but, no but it also you know it also kind of opened the door to the career that I have now so I'm very I've always been very thankful yeah. to Charlie for that but that's so that's that's how it worked but there were there were no you know the, the money making options to the you know say for example somebody like Alistair Brown who's always is a great man to bring up um, because he was so ahead of his time in terms of, of white ball cricket in terms of one day cricket anyway and played very little of it you know now that guy would be the squads would be he'd be in every single England squad if somebody of his talent his consistency of ball striking and, and all whatever. the leagues oh absolutely yeah. and all the leagues yeah. yeah he would have played in everything he would have been yeah. very very highly sought after there just wasn't that particularly for English players I always remember thinking that, that the English players were the only professionals in the world at the time I think at least notionally anyway, you know, that they had contracts for Australian players and whatever. But generally speaking, your first class players were, were the only professional ones in the world. But we were the only ones who couldn't get a gig anywhere else outside of our summer. <laughs> you know, whereas everybody else played all year round, the English guys would have to be, you know, coaching in schools or doing whatever they did. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess that, that there is just less time for players to focus on Red Bull cricket now, if you're one of the really good ones. Um, by the way, Hasib Hamid, 85 not out. He's at 27 off his last 30 balls. How many, do you think he, how many do you think he needs to get in the first <laughs> test? Like 115? Well, I think get, get, get 100. Get 100. This is what I'm saying, is that the guys, the other guys, with the exception of Burns, who has not looked bulletproof, either, have not scored any runs at all. None. Like zip, 
zero. And what you could say, you know, I remember, again, sort of, you could see people not score any runs at the beginning of a tour and just go, well, it doesn't matter. They're only warm-up games. Nobody cares. But they've had almost an entire year of first-class cricket to score no runs. So, it's, of course, it's wildly significant. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm doing what you should be doing. I'm getting excited about the narrative <laughs> and stuff. Because from, from a cricketing point of view, I can see it makes sense. You're kind of holding yourself back because you don't want people to accuse you of just being bored of writing about the same old people. <laughs> no, I'm worried about him. I'm worried about him as well. I don't want, him, I don't want his career his to hair, collapse he, again. He's got the hair. He's confident. He's all, it's all good. We should turn this into like a watch-along thing. I mean, it, it's, it's not get, far get off Get him that. on it's it. It's not yeah. far off that. Um, we've not talked about the... England Pakistan T20 hours, which was an amazing series. England won it two oh, one in the end, um, but it was a, it was a dream series for for Liam Livingston. Scored the fastest hundred by an Englishman ever in in the op- in the opener. Hit the biggest six I've ever seen in the second, and then got a standing ovation for a two ball six in the finale, which has got to be the one uh, the, the one that you remember for for, for longest. Um, Ta, is 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 he in your England eleven for the T20 World Cup opener? And and if so, you can't just say yes. Where's he slotting in? <laughs> are we doing this again are we we're doing our yeah. t20 world cup 11 <laughs> I'm, I'm <not> back. <laughs> i mean to to try and break into this team is just so hard and to make the case he's made in the last three games even with the two ball six it's phenomenal because that two ball six is almost the, the strongest case because what you've been looking for in this england side for a while now someone you can tee off right from the start <laughs> and that's what he did in that innings um with that first ball six of course yeah um yeah, <sighs> it was good though, wasn't he? He was, <laughs> he was brilliant. He was brilliant. I think the only thing that could have helped him was getting some wickets with the ball. But he's, you can still see that he's a pretty handy bowler. He can offer that mm. legs, you know, leggies to the right hander, offies to the left. Um, if I'm fitting him in, <sighs> you could have him at seven, but then if you've only just got Stokes there and no Moeen say that's the case then you're then that's that's potentially quite risky and I feel like as it, just as a fifth bowler it's got to depend bowler. a bit on conditions right as well. yeah, yeah it's obviously yeah. the, the farce of this conversation we we keep having yeah, as okay. enjoyable as it is but because for, for me uh, for me it comes down to i would pick two of sam curran moen and livingston uh and i would drop milan and put stokes up the order to make room for that mm. uh and then uh, at the moment if i was picking aside tomorrow for a world cup final i think livingston has to be in it because his form is so sensational but you know that could all change by the time we get there uh i would lean towards livingston and curran with moen on the bench but you know you can be quite knee jerk about these things about three days ago moen was the man of the match so <laughs> it, it, it's really tough and if, if there was genuine turn then you would probably want moen on that side and then maybe sam curran is under threat yeah, I was, I was going to say, I thought people, people have forgotten about Sam Curran. He's been really good for England in T20 cricket. He did really well in the IPL. Do you, know, you know what really counts in Liam Livingston's favour is he's not left-handed. Mm. Uh, that's the, the thing that bothers me about England in that it, when they have all of their sort of big guns to choose from is just the amount of left-handers that you roll up, which means that somebody like Hafiz can come in and, and almost win a, win a game. Which is not to say that he's not that he's not a very very wily and clever yeah, bowler. Brilliant record. I was surprised no, no, when that yeah, came up. But, but yeah, what, but what yeah. I'm saying is, is that you know a, a team that has the team that has a sort of it's like you activate the off spinner, don't you? The guy sort of lurking in the outfield, he's got nothing to do, and then you play against England, <laughs> suddenly, bing, he becomes he becomes a handy man in the opposition side, you know. Um, so so that's so I think I think he, that that gets him that gets him in. Um, yeah. And and England are going to have to be listen. England are not world champions in T20 cricket. England's um, form. And record in T20 cricket is nowhere near as compelling as it was in the 50-over side where you have to say, oh, well, hang on, this is sacrosanct. This all stays the same. Mm. I'm very, very loose about the idea that, some, you know, that, that Milan might not play in one game. They'll all be in the squad. I mean, you can take a thousand people on the trip anyway. It's not a problem. But I'm very, very sanguine about the idea that you, that you would have them all and you would decide, on the, decide to pick which ones you want to go with. And I think Livingston, as, as being the sort of thunderous right-handed batsman that he is, you can go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, um, is somebody that, that will probably find himself in, in more, off, more 11s than he doesn't. I, think I, I mean, I think the thing we've learned over the last few weeks is like, even with that ODI squad and what happened there, is that... Uh, like like Butch said, I mean, you just need to get everyone on the plane and then whatever team you put out is still going to be a really good team, a team that's going to threaten to win a World Cup. So you can say we can have David Milan or not have David Milan. With David Milan, England have been brilliant. Without him, they could still be brilliant and still win a World Cup. So it's almost like you don't... 
I'm trying. I'm basically bailing out of the question, but you can just kind of, you know, pick whatever eleven you want. And I don't, you, think, there's, I don't think there's an answer. I don't think there's an answer to it. I think England, and I'm sure Owen Morgan is all over this. Could be just could could be smarter still in terms of their matchups with people, the opposition and their strengths and who that who their dangers are, and counter them better with you know with with the idea of not lining up four left hands in the trot. I mean, that's the thing that like, you just look at that and go, why are they doing that? Why would you do that? Um, uh, so, you know, I also think somebody like CJ, who I'm a huge fan, Chris, Chris Jordan, is kind of like, you're thinking to yourself, how, you know, one in, what is it, one in every five or six, he'll, he'll win you a game, close you out, one at the death, but he goes for loads in the power play and he's not, you know what I mean, brilliant fielder, can come in and win you a game last night. Just by the way, was anybody else throwing stuff at the television? Um, what when Morgan got well, out? Yeah, well, Livingston sort of gets his two ball six, right? So he hits the six. Everyone goes bizarre. You go, well, it's now a runner ball. Now just win the game and walk off. No, I'm going to slog the next one up in the air. Morgan then slogs the next one. I'm just going, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> the way they play, Butch. But it's politics. <laughs> it? It's reminded me of Mo, of Mo and Ali doing that at, at, down at Malahide. Uh, was it? No, it wasn't Malahide. It was up at the Grange, wasn't it? When England lost to Scotland on that, that incredible day. Had the game won. Just win it now. Don't, there's no need to keep hitting every ball for six because you get you, you don't you don't you cloth one when you only need four and over, and suddenly you lose. It just doesn't make it. That just makes no sense to me. None, none whatsoever. Why give the opposition a chance of winning a game that they are completely out of, which both of them did. No, I, yeah, I, I did. I found Morgan's shot particularly weird. Yeah, you that four, was that yeah, was when I, I threw was... something because I thought, well, okay, <laughs> but Livingston, okay, but Morgan's still there, and he, they cross, and he just slogs yeah. the next one straight up, and it's like, but come on. As Joe says, that is the England way. Well, um, also, unintended. Which is fine if they win, if they win the tournament, but yeah, you know. Um, an un- unintended consequence of England packing their side with left-handers was that poor old Mohamed Hussain didn't get a bowl. So he, he was down to about 11 and didn't bowl. And um, did that awful misfield <laughs> yeah. where he completely misread the spin. Which is <laughs> um, yeah. Got a load of abuse from the fans down there. But it was yeah. an excellent game. Just, just on uh, on Livingston, I think there's a lot to like about him as a bloke. I've interviewed him only a couple of times, but he's, he's brilliantly... He's kind of cocky, but in a quite... Um, not a way that kind of puts you off him. And it's very like uncomplicated blunt I just whack it and when he walked out he was kind of dripping with confidence like his chest was really like physically out there not just kind of (laughs) metaphorically speaking it's just like that first ball was going for six almost wherever he bowled it and obviously it was right in the slot um yeah I think that he obviously brings a lot and the fact he's bowling and the fact he's switching from offies to leggies depending on who he's bowling at Another really useful little thing to have in the Very side. Very handy. He's, 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 he's becoming a bit of a captain's dream. He's tempered that a little bit as well, the cockiness. Because it, 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 what there was, well, as, 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 as recently as a couple of years ago, he just saw, mate, seriously, you're, you're not Viv Richards, please. Just tone it down a little bit. And now he is. And that, well, <laughs> but, but I mean, exactly. Now, now it's be, it's being backed up with whatever else it is. And I think you know he had he had a. Quite, a, he had a few run-ins with people. He was always looking to pick fights with people and all that kind of stuff. It was kind of like a slightly boorish way of behaving on the field. But um, but that seems to have been sort of ironed out. Bit of maturity and yeah, great. He's great. He's brilliant to watch. I mean, more than anything else. I mean, you see somebody swing that hard and the way he hits Christ. quick ball, like properly quick balls for six over the yeah. head. Like obviously, everyone remarked yeah. on how far he hit the six off um, yeah. uh, Harris Ralph. But mm. actually, like that was a ninety-one mile per hour delivery. That he went, Full swing and then go boom. That was that was amazing. Uh, one of the thing, one of the thing that was interesting from the series, I thought, was Owen Morgan yesterday off the game saying he didn't expect the ball to actually spin as much in the UAE as it has done <laughs> this series in England, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but Ty, your your moment of the week was from that series, and it was to do with English spinners. Yeah, I mean, England fielding two leg spinners feels you know significant. It's like a it's like a moment, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I I just didn't think they would ever do it. I thought it was always going to be with, um, you know, if Rashid's rested like he was in that first T20 and Parkinson comes in and then if Rashid's going to come back in, it will be for Parkinson. Um, but then again, you know, Owen Morgan is, you know, the the ultra aggressive, the, the captain. I mean, this was, you know, perhaps it's it's surprising that it's taken six years for, for this to happen. Um, I guess we've just been waiting for Matt Parkinson. Um, but yeah, that felt... I felt exciting. Um, and there's there's a clear method to how they can do it where Rashid can sort of operate in the power play and then Parkinson obviously comes into his own in the in the middle overs. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big... It's always like we've had these series with England in the past where we've not really learned much because they've, you know, kept things the same. Like in India, they didn't really change the team. 
Um, and this series, we kind of learned a lot of things because they actually decided to experiment and maybe they've got their timing, timing, you know, maybe they've timed everything perfectly this time. And um, now, now there's a realistic option that we see those two line up in a, in a World Cup game. Not, not every game, but when the conditions suit. Um, and that's, that's exciting because we spin, we've, we've learned this for years. We've known this for years that wrist spin works brilliantly in T20. The, the, the best spin bowlers there are are, are, are wrist spinners. I mean, so it's it's great that England have actually. You say after plucked. abandoning your own leg spin, Taha, and switching to medium pace. <laughs> was it? Let's let's not talk about my cricket. <laughs> Before we go on with the rest of the show, Taha and I have just watched the first ever game of the hundred, and it was an absolute thriller. The Oval Invincibles were twelve for three, chasing one hundred and thirty-six after sixteen balls, and they ended up winning it with two balls to spare. Daniel van Nierkirk with the first ever fifty in the history of the 100. So oh, that was that was great fun. What were your overall impressions of that game? It was, yeah, I'm a bit, I'm a bit lost for words right now. Um, especially that last half an hour. I mean, it was just quite an incredible spectacle. Um, um, the, the roars at the end as Van Nierkirk, I mean, just played a brilliant knock. I mean, the roars at the end as, as they were getting closer because they were kind of out of it at the start of that innings. They were three down for, for not much and it looked like, all right, this is, this is going to be a bit of a, a procession, a bit of, you know, maybe slightly disappointing for the first game, but I don't think you could really have asked for more than that. That was that was quite the finish. On the crowd, it was a record crowd for a professional domestic women's game in the UK, just under 8,000, but it felt a lot more than that. We've been to a lot of T20 Blast games here at the Oval, and the, the noise genuinely rivaled that, and definitely in terms of the investment in the cricket itself. Yeah, I mean, I think just taking a look around the ground, I had a little wonder... A lot of kids, and you could kind of sense that in the in the, in the way that you know we were listening to the crowd. Um, a lot more of a you know family affair, which I guess you know what is one of the goals of this competition. Um, yeah, it was unusual. It's kind of I've been here for T Twenty Blast games, and to be honest, I've only really ever been here for really one sided T Twenty Blast games. So I don't really hear the roars like that. Um, so it was really special and kind of yeah, it's something I've never really experienced at this ground. First impressions of the format, how different did it feel to a game of T20? Better, worse, did you not really care, not really notice? I didn't really notice. It didn't feel particularly revolutionary in the in the in the actual cricket itself. It was you know, it flowed like a T twenty, you know, you sense it in the first innings where it was, you know, maybe in the middle it was with the spinners coming on, it was, you know, rotate the strike, whatever, and then at the end you get the death, you get, you know, smashing out and all that mm. kind of thing, the first sixes of the of the tournament as well. So I I, I I wanted to pay attention to maybe someone bowling 10 balls in a row, but I kind of, I couldn't, you know, it was kind of just, it just felt like a normal T20 game. You know, I, I don't know what, what did you think? I mean, for, to me, it just, you know, it didn't feel anything too drastically different. It felt very, very similar. I think the, the 10 ball over stuff is really interesting from a tactical point of view. I'm just quite interested to see how teams will utilize that. And I yeah. Think teams will work out what works. Um, so I think that'll be interesting. You could tell Kate Cross the toss said, We'll, we'll, um, we'll have a bat first we're just not sure what you know we're not sure how it's going to go yeah. so we'll, have, we'll, have a, we'll have a look um, the only thing I kind of noticed that was different was I found it harder to know what a good score was at the time because you don't have overs in the traditional sense on the scoreboard you've got balls hmm. which by the way is a lot of talk before the tournament about how complicated the scoreboard is going to be I thought it was very very simple I think if you're a new fan if you're, if you're new to cricket that is more straightforward than what you we were used to seeing in the T20 Blast um, but yeah, overall, it kind of just felt like a T20 that, that was just a little bit shorter. Um, they got through their overs just about, I'm, I must admit, I'm not really sure uh, how the cut-off time stuff works. <laughs> yeah. It changes so much. <laughs> yeah, it changes. Um, yeah. But the team just about managed to stay within that. Um, and yeah, how, how, did you, how did you feel the game, game flowed? I, I mean, it was, like, like I said, it was just like a T20. I yeah. mean, it was just a great game in general in terms of, I wasn't, there, there was a point in that, you know, in that last half an hour before, mm. where I wasn't really thinking about what the format is, what not. It's just like, oh, we've got a good game here because, mm. you know, they were out of it and Van Nierkirk and Kat bring it back. And, you know, it, it I guess it flowed as, as well as he could have. Mm. It was, it was a proper, it was a proper game. It wasn't, you know, no one rolled over anyone else. It was just a, a decent game of cricket. Absolutely. I echo all that. Um, I thought it was a thoroughly enjoyable evening um we'll, we'll let you go back to the rest of the pod enjoy um birch got a question specifically for you um p 
Peter Miller asks, under what circumstances would Butch decide not to run out Rob Key? <laughs> uh, maybe, oh, I don't know. Maybe if a mole poked its head up out of the square and tripped him over. <laughs> I might still take the bales off, though, just to check that it, that it made contact. Um, what, what a palaver. I mean, do, do you want to explain <laughs> what happened? Not, not, uh, most people would have seen it, but yeah. may, maybe not everyone. No. Well, well what, basically what <laughs> happened was Stephen Croft, the game's getting a little bit tight. Yorkshire have, Yorkshire have um, taken a couple of wickets and it's just starting to get tasty at, at, at Old Trafford. Yorkshire didn't need to win to qualify, but Lancashire did. Um, and the ball gets hit to mid, I don't know, I can't remember if it's left or right hand on strike. But anyway, it gets to mid off or mid on inside the circle. And the call, the call comes from the striker's end. Crofty sets off, but basically doesn't back, him, back the judgment of it. And halfway through the run, sticks, his, sticks the anchors on, puts his, puts his left foot down to stop himself, and, base, and, just, and slips and falls over, right? Falls over, clutching his leg, and the ball sort of like ends up bumbling around and in the, in the hand of a fielder who gets it to the wicketkeeper, holds it over the, holds it over the bales. Joe Root kind of goes, oh, no, and they don't run him out, Okay. Fine. All, all of this is completely and utterly above board. They didn't run him out. They made the decision not to run him out. My argument was he just fell over. And if he had fallen over and not been rolling around and, and like he'd been shot, then you would have run him out, right? So what difference does it make? He fell over and he's injured himself. Mm. You just, and, it, and it was just cramp at the end. And, and, and it yeah. turned out it was just cramp. Now, all of this is absolutely fine. Yorkshire are well within their rights to, to not run somebody out. My issue was this. It was not that Stephen Croft then got up and was sprinting twos like Linford Christie at like the, the very next ball and got him home and won in the game. My issue was with people who were saying that it was unsporting of me to say that Yorkshire should have run him out, but who did not think that it was unsporting for the batsman who'd been given a life on finding out that he was absolutely fine, didn't then run himself out when they replayed the ball and say, fair enough, thanks guys, there's nothing wrong with me, I'll go. Because if one thing is unsporting, then the other thing is unsporting too. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I wasn't accusing Crofty of anything. The Yorkshire wanted to give him a life. Then that's up to them. Daft, I wouldn't have done it. Rob Key would have. I wouldn't. I'd have run him out. And then you wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have had any issue. The other side to this is, is, is this. If he had been seriously injured, he would have played no further part in the game, right? So whether he was run out or whether he wasn't run out, it wouldn't have made any difference because he's not coming back with a broken leg or whatever it was that he might have done. Heart attack. They would have cancelled the game and been a heart attack. So the fact that you run him out would have made no difference anyhow because he's not playing any further part in the game. He couldn't get up and win you the match. That's what happened. That was what caused all kinds of carnage on, uh, online and still, and still continues to do so from the, for this moment in time. And that's your moment of the week as well. It is my moment of the week <laughs> because, because I still, I'm still staggered by the idea that somebody falling over is grounds not to be out. I just don't understand. Yeah, I, I thought it was pr- I, I, can't, I, I was kind of with you. Uh, I'd have run him out every yeah, day of the week. I wouldn't even consider it. <laughs> Um, I'm surprised I thought it would be so over. instinctive they wouldn't have had time to actually think about this and the process but see what's the, what slowed it down the thing that messed it up was that the throw came in and it, and it got fumbled and somebody ended up picking it up from the middle of the pitch so they had a bit of time while he's to see that he's now rolling about on the ground and he did he got cramp <laughs> since when is since when is having cramp a good enough reason not to be out it's just bizarre and did you and Rob Key leave it on the evening, or have you been no, exchanging no. messages? Well, no, since? no, we, we went back. Nick Knight said something about buying us both a drink, which of course he didn't do because uh, he's very, very tight. Um, and we, yeah, we, we, we sort of talk. The thing, the other thing about all of this is that Keezy is a very much, an, as, as I am, very much sort of an advocate that the spirit of cricket really should never come into it because when it does, this sort of thing happens. If you just play to the rules of the game, there's no problem with what happened that day. The moment you bring in the, some sort of morality into it, you know, so everyone's having a go at my morals. Like I haven't got any, but nobody picked up on the fact that the that the so-called injured party was absolutely fine. And one of the guys, and I'm sure that these are the same people who were looking at Italian players rolling about on the floor, then celebrating goals and going, "Oh, that's disgusting." Well, the same things happened here, but it doesn't seem to bother you too much. Yeah. There. Interesting. Um, <laughs> the the T20 Blast group stage has come to an end. The quarter-final spots have been finalised. Um, it's actually the six teams who qualify for Division 1 of the County Championship. That's Somerset, Hampshire, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Notts and Warwickshire, as well as Sussex and Kent, um, which is quite interesting. Um, there was an incredible innings from Tom Lambie 
at Taunton, which but you're at. Um, so after 14.3 overs in some sets innings, and they're really not going well at this point, he's a six off five. He then finishes the innings on 90 off 36 and basically wins them the game on his own. Um, that It was an ex- extraordinary inning. And he's also been, I know we talked about him quite a lot last year, um, but he's he's been out of nick. He wasn't in the Somerset side at the start of the tournament. Really struggled for runs in the county championship. So it's really good to see him get back into form. Um, Joe, your moment of the week is to do with T20 cricket um, and the hundreds that we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, yeah, just a nice little story. So uh, as you said, Birmingham Bears needed to win their final game to, to go through, which they did. And it was a debutant called Chris Benjamin, a 22-year-old keeper batsman uh, from Johannesburg who came over here four or five years ago. Um, so yeah, hit 60 not out from 34 balls on debut. He'd actually come out earlier in the innings because uh, Adam Hose had been uh, injured and he came out as a runner, which actually when I spoke to Chris Benjamin yesterday, he said it really helped being out there for the first, for a few overs as a runner to get a feel for the atmosphere, get used to the crowd, see what the pitch is doing. So he said by the time he actually came to face the ball, he felt like he'd been out there for <laughs> overs himself. Uh, and he certainly played like that. Um, effectively won them the game uh, and then just before I spoke to him yesterday I got a call from um, the media man at Warwickshire saying this guy's actually been picked up for the 100 so after one T20 game he's been picked up by Birmingham Phoenix as a replacement player um, he's only on a rookie contract at Warwickshire so this is all happening very quickly for a, for a bloke who came over went to Durham University did a degree in uh, accounting and finance hoping cricket would come off but not necessarily expecting that he would he trialled at Essex got turned down there and within the space of three, four days, his career has suddenly exploded. And, you know, the way things are going, he might well get a chance for Birmingham Phoenix. And, and who knows where you go from there. Uh, and it looks like Warwick Shearer have found, just to say as well, he got his uh, got his in the team based on a extraordinary innings in the second 11. He hit 149 from 66 balls for the second 11 against Glamorgan. And then captains Warwick Shearer's twos to the T20 uh, victory in in the seconds competition so it's not a fluke he's obviously a serious player and it's actually in another innings for the second 11 that Mo and Ali saw him smashing sixes against the spinners and Mo and Ali obviously captain of Birmingham Phoenix liked what he saw and I think that's what's led to him being picked up over the last couple of days so an interesting name to, to follow over the next over the next few weeks mm, that's interesting um, obviously you mentioned at the start of the show that the first ever game the 100 taking place tonight um, me and Tara are going to record a little bit after the first game takes place, kind of reacting to what, what our first impressions were of the tournament, um, etc. Um, so just to end the show, we'll go through what's happened in international cricket this week, aside from England, obviously. Um, Australia 1-0 up in their ODI series against West Indies. Mitchell Stark took 5-48 as Australia bowled West Indies out for 123 in the series opener. Bangladesh beat Zimbabwe 3-0 in an ODI series and some more crucial ODI World Cup Super League points there. Um, the, the result that will genuinely have implications for sides like South Africa, West Indies, Pakistan, etc. Bangladesh are going really well in the tournament. They're actually second in the points table at the moment. Um, the second game of the series was an excellent one. Shakib scored an unbeaten 96, shepherding the tail to guide them home by three wickets. India, without any of their test squad, a 2 up against Sri Lanka. The second game was really good. India were 193 for seven, chasing 277. And Deepak Chahar scored an unbeaten 69 from number eight to see the tourists home by three wickets. Um, and finally, before we finish the show, a reminder to sign up for our fantasy game, the Cricket Draft, powered by Wisdom. The details to sign up to our listeners' league are in the description for this episode. Um, that's all we have for this show, Tar. Cheers, Joe. Cheers. Cheers, Butch. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, tell your friends, and we'll be back next week. Cheers. Cheers.